exiting the European Union. We have now had three days of debate on the withdrawal agreement, setting out the terms of our departure from the EU and the political declaration setting out our future relationship after we have left. I have listened very carefully to what has been said in this chamber and out of it. what has been said in this chamber and out of it by members from all sides. From listening to those views, it is clear that while there is broad support for many of the key aspects of the deal, on one issue, on one issue the Northern Ireland backstop, there remains widespread and deep concern. As a result, if we went ahead and held the vote tomorrow, the deal would be rejected by a significant margin. We will therefore defer the vote scheduled for tomorrow and not proceed to divide the House at this time. I set out in my speech opening the debate last week the reasons why the backstop is a necessary guarantee to the people of Northern Ireland and why, whatever future relationship you want, there is no deal available that does not include the backstop. Behind all those arguments are some inescapable facts. The fact that Northern Ireland shares a land border with another sovereign state. The fact, the fact that the hard-won peace, the fact that the hard-won peace that has been built in Northern Ireland over the last two decades has been built around a seamless border, and the fact that Brexit will create a wholly new situation. On the 30th of March, the Northern Ireland Ireland border will for the first time become the external frontier of the European Union's single market and customs union. The challenge, the challenge this poses must be met, not with rhetoric, but with real and workable solutions. Businesses operate across that border. People live their lives crossing and recrossing it every day. I have been there and spoken to some of those people. They do not want their everyday lives to change as a result of the decision we have taken. They do not want a return to our hard border. And if this House cares about preserving our union, it must listen to those people, because our union will only endure with their consent. We had hoped that the changes we have secured to the backstop would reassure members that we could never be trapped in it indefinitely. I hope the House will forgive me if I take a moment to remind it of those changes. The customs element of the backstop is now UK-wide. It no longer splits our country into two customs territories. This also means that the backstop is now an uncomfortable arrangement for the EU, so they won't want it to come into use or persist for long if it does. Both sides are now legally committed to using best endeavours to have our new relationship in place before the end of the implementation period, ensuring the backstop is never used. If our new relationship is not ready, we can now choose to extend the implementation period, further reducing the likelihood of the backstop coming into use. If the backstop ever does come into use, we now do not have to get the new relationship in place to get out of it. Alternative arrangements that make use of technology could be put in place instead. The treaty, the treaty is now clear that the backstop can only ever be temporary, and there is now a termination clause. But I, but I am clear, what I, from what I have heard in this place and from my own conversations, that these elements do not offer a sufficient number of colleagues the reassurance that they need. I spoke to a number of EU leaders over the weekend, and in advance of the European Council, I will go to see my counterparts in other member states and the leadership of the Council and the Commission. I will discuss with them the clear concerns that this House has expressed. We are also looking closely at new ways of empowering the House of Commons to ensure that any provision for a backstop has democratic legitimacy and to enable the House to place its own obligations on the Government to enable the House to place its own obligations on the Government to ensure that the backstop cannot be in place indefinitely. Mr Speaker, having spent the best part of two years poring over the detail of Brexit, listening to the public's ambitions and, yes, their fears too, and testing the limits of what the other side is prepared to accept, 
I am in absolutely no doubt that this deal is the right one. It honours the result of the referendum. It pro- Order. The remainder of the statement must be heard, and I invite the House to hear it with courtesy, and for the avoidance of doubt and also the benefit of those attending to our proceedings who are not members of the House, I emphasise that, as per usual, I will call everyone who wants to question the Prime Minister. But meanwhile, please hear her. The Prime Minister. It honours the result of the referendum, it protects jobs, security and our union, but it also represents the very best deal that is actually negotiable with the EU. I believe in it, as do many members of this House, and I still believe there is a majority to be won in this House in support of it if I can secure additional reassurance on the question of the backstop, and that is what my focus will be in the days ahead. But, Mr Speaker, if you take a step back, It is clear that this House faces a much more fundamental question. Does this House want to deliver Brexit? (laughs) And uh, a clear clear message from the SNP, but if the House does... Does it want to do so through reaching an agreement with the EU? If the answer is yes, and I believe that is the answer of the majority of this House, then we all have to ask ourselves whether we are prepared to make a compromise, because there will be no enduring and successful Brexit without some compromise on both sides of the debate. Many of the most controversial aspects of this deal, including the backstop, are simply inescapable facts of having a negotiated Brexit. Those members who continue to disagree need to shoulder the responsibility of advocating an alternative solution that can be delivered, and do so so without ducking its implications. So if you want a second referendum to overturn the result of the first, be honest that this risks dividing the country again. Be honest that this risks dividing the country again, when as a House we should be striving to bring it back together. If you you want to remain part of the single market and the customs union, be open that this would require free movement, rule taking across the economy and ongoing financial contributions, none of which are, in my view, compatible with the result of the referendum. If you and if If you want to leave without a deal, be upfront that in the short term this would cause significant economic damage to parts of our country who can least afford to bear the burden. I do not believe that any of those courses of action command a majority in this House. But notwithstanding that fact, for as long as we fail to agree a deal, the risk of an accidental no deal increases. So the Government So the Government will step up its work in preparation for that potential outcome, and the Cabinet will hold further discussions on it this week. The vast majority of us, Mr Speaker, accept the result of the referendum and want to leave with a deal. We have a responsibility to discharge. If we will the ends, we must also will the means. And I know that members across the House appreciate how important that responsibility is. And I'm very grateful to all members on this side of the House and a few on the other side too, who've backed this deal and spoken up for it. Many, many others, many others I know have been wrestling with their consciences, particularly over the question of the backstop, seized of the need to face up to the challenge posed by the Irish border, but genuinely concerned about the consequences. I have listened, I have heard those concerns, and I will now do everything I possibly can to secure further assurances. If I may conclude, Mr Speaker, on a personal note, on the morning after the referendum two and a half years ago, I knew that we had witnessed a defining moment for our democracy. Places that did not get a lot of attention at elections and which did not get much coverage on the news were making their voices heard and saying that they wanted things to change. I knew in that moment that Parliament had to deliver for them. 
But of course, that doesn't just mean delivering Brexit. It means working across all areas, building a stronger economy, improving public services, tackling, tackling, tackling social injustices, to make this a country that truly works for everyone. Uh, the Prime Minister must be heard. The Prime Minister. Tackling social injustices to make this a country that truly works for everyone, a country where nowhere and nobody is left behind. And these matters are too important to be afterthoughts in our politics. They deserve to be at the centre of our thinking. But that can only happen if we get Brexit done and get it done right. And even though I voted Remain, from the moment I took up the responsibility of being Prime Minister of this great country, I have known that my duty is to honour the result of that vote, and I have been just as determined to protect the jobs that put food on the tables of working families and the security partnerships, and the security partnerships that keep each one of us safe. And that is what this deal does. It gives us control of our borders, our money and our laws. It protects jobs, security and our union. It is the right deal for Britain. I am determined to do all I can to secure the reassurances this House requires to get this deal over the line and deliver for the British people, and I commend this statement to the House. Jeremy Corbyn! Thank you. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I thank the Prime Minister for a copy of the statement before we... we met here this afternoon. We are in an extremely serious and unprecedented situation. The Government has lost control of events and is in complete disarray. It has been evident for weeks that the Prime Minister's deal did not have the confidence of this House. Yet she ploughed on regardless, reiterating this is the only deal available. Can she be clear with the House? Is she seeking changes to the deal? or mere reassurances. Does she therefore accept the statement from the European Commission at lunchtime saying that it was the only deal possible, we will not renegotiate, our position has not changed? Ireland's Taoiseach, Leo Varadkar, has said it is not possible to renegotiate the Irish border backstop, stating that it was the Prime Minister's own red lines that made the backstop necessary. So can the Prime Minister be clear? Is she now ready to drop further red lines in order to make progress? Mr Speaker, can the Prime Minister confirm that the deal presented to this House is not off the table, but will be represented with a few assurances? Mm -hmm. Bringing back the same botched deal either next week or in January, and can she be clear on the timing? will not change its fundamental flaws and deeply held objections right across this House, which go far wider than the backstop alone. Yes. Mr Speaker, this is a bad deal for Britain, a bad deal for our economy and a bad deal for our democracy. Our country deserves better than this. Yes. The real damage... The, the deal... The deal damages our economy, and it isn't just the opposition saying that. The government's own analysis shows this deal would make us worse off. Yeah. If the Prime Minister cannot be clear that she can and will ne- renegotiate a deal, then she must make way. And if she is And, Mr Speaker, if she is going back to Brussels, then she needs to build a consensus in this House. And since it appears business has changed for the next two days, then it seems not only possible but necessary that this House debates the negotiating mandate that the Prime Minister takes to Brussels. There is no point, no point at all, in this Prime Minister bringing back the same deal again, which clearly does not support the, is not supported by this House. Yeah. Mr Speaker, we have endured two years of shambolic negotiations, yes. red lines which have been boldly announced, then cast aside, yeah. 
We are now on our third Brexit secretary, and it appears each one of them has been excluded from these vital negotiations. We were promised a precise and substantive document and got a vague 26-page wish list, and they become the first government ever in British history to be held in contempt of Parliament. The government is in disarray. Uncertainty is building for business. People are in despair at the state of these failed negotiations and concerned about what it means about their jobs, their livelihood and their communities. And the fault for that lies solely at the door of this shambolic government. The Prime Minister is trying to buy herself one last chance to save this deal. If she doesn't take on board the fundamental changes required, then she must make way for those who can. Can I, I think I hope I can respond fairly uh, briefly to the Right Honourable Gentleman. The Right Honourable Gentleman appeared to argue, on one hand, that it wasn't possible to change the deal because the EU had said this was the only deal, and on the other hand, that the only thing he would accept was the deal being renegotiated. No, the Right Honourable Gentleman quoted the European Union as saying this was the only deal, and then goes on to say that the whole deal needs to be renegotiated. This is the, the fundamental question that members of this House have to ask themselves is whether they wish to deliver Brexit and honour the result of the referendum. If you wish to deli- all the analysis shows that if you wish to deliver Brexit, if you wish to honour the result of the referendum, then the deal that does that, that best protects jobs and our economy, is the deal that is on that the government has put forward. That Everybody will have his or her chance, but the questions have been put and the answers must similarly be heard. The Prime Minister. That is the fundamental question for members of this House, to deliver on and honour the result of the referendum, but to do it in a way that protects jobs and our economy, and that is what this deal does. The Right Honourable Gentleman talks about a number of issues. He, he wants to be in the customs union such that free movement would have to, and the single market and free movement would have to be accepted. He refuses to accept that any deal requires a backstop because that's our commitment to the people of Northern Ireland. He claims he wants to negotiate trade deals, yet wants to be in the customs union, fully in the customs union, that will not enable us to negotiate those trade deals. And finally, he says about the uncertainty, he says about uncertainty for British business. I can tell the right honourable gentleman that the biggest uncertainty for British business lies not in this deal, but on the front bench of the Labour Party. Order. Before I look to the Father of the House and then other colleagues, I want to say the following. Although the Government's intention to halt this debate at this inordinately late stage has been widely leaked to the media in advance, I felt it only appropriate to hear what is proposed before advising the House. Halting the debate after no fewer than 164 colleagues have taken the trouble to contribute, will be thought by many members of this House to be deeply discourteous. Indeed, in the hours since news of this intention emerged, many colleagues from across the House have registered that view to me in the most forceful terms. Having taken the best procedural advice, colleagues should be informed that there are two ways of doing this. The first, and in democratic terms the infinitely preferable way, is for a minister to move at the outset of the debate that the debate be adjourned. This will give the House the opportunity to express its view in a vote whether or not it wishes the debate 
to be brought to a premature and inconclusive end. I can reassure ministers that I would be happy to accept such a motion so that the House can decide. The alternative is for the Government unilaterally to decline to move today's business, which means that the House is not only deprived of its opportunity to vote upon the substance of the debate tomorrow, but also that it is given no chance to express its view today on whether the debate should or should not be allowed to continue. I politely suggest that in any courteous, respectful and mature environment, allowing the House to have a say, its say, on this matter would be the right and, dare I say it, the obvious course to take. Let us see if those who have assured this House and the public over and over and over again that this supremely important vote is going to take place tomorrow without fail wish to rise to the occasion. Mr Kenneth Clark. Uh, Mr Speaker, uh, on, the, on the question of Europe, this House is not uh, just divided into parties, it's divided into factions. And it becomes clear that at the moment there is no predictable majority for any single course of action going forward. Uh, so uh, would my right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, agree that no other governments are going to start negotiations with us on any new arrangement, whilst the British continue to explore what exactly it is they can get a parliamentary majority to agree to? <laughs> Furthermore, we are strictly bound, quite rightly, to the Good Friday Agreement and the issue of a permanently open border in Ireland. So does she agree that it's particularly folly for a large faction in this House to continue for an argument, to, to, an argument that we should insist to the other governments that the British will have a unilateral right to declare an end to that open border at a time of their choosing, which is why the backstop remains inevitable. Well, can I say to my right honourable and learned friend that I certainly agree. I think none of the alternative arrangements that have been floated uh, and su suggested in this House actually would command a majority of this House. But he is also right that we retain our absolute commitment to the Belfast Good Friday Agreement and to uh, the commitments with it that the United Kingdom Government made within uh, that agreement. And any agreement which had to be was being negotiated with the European Union be that either of the other two options that are normally quoted, the Norway option of some form or the Canada option of some form, would require negotiation, could risk the possibility of there being a period of time uh, when that relationship was not in place, and therefore would indeed require a backstop. Yeah, yeah. Kirsty Blackman. Yeah. Yeah. I'd like to thank the Prime Minister for advance sight of the statement and thank you, Mr Speaker, for the benefit of your words in relation to how this could proceed. Um, the events of the past few hours have highlighted that this is a government in a total state of collapse. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. The Prime Minister has been forced to pull tomorrow's vote in a stunning display of pathetic cowardice. Yeah. 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 The vote tomorrow night would have shown the will of this House, but this government is... You were just listening to that debate taking place.